week eight, eight, seven. Well, hold on. I think that should be the sheet here. Um, it says seven, but I believe we are in week eight. That won't belabor the point. Um, bring up our syllabus right quick. Yeah, thought it was uh, eight. So welcome to week eight of the Old Testament books of poetry. And um, good group here. <clears throat> Let's pray together and we will get started. Loving Father, we pause here as we get ready to begin our study. We thank you that we can come to your throne of grace any time and any place, though we're scattered over a large part of the state. Father, we are together in your throne room and in your presence. Thank you for the way that you transcend time and space, the way that you bring us together. Thank you for technology that allows us to do this, but uh, even more so than the technology, <clears throat> the way your Holy Spirit works in our hearts. Father, as we get ready to study, we invite you into our presence. As we continue through the Psalms, we ask your spirit to be present with us, to give us uh, a clearer understanding of you, to know you better, to love you more deeply. Uh, and even as many of these point to your son, uh, to know, love, and follow Jesus more faithfully in our lives. Let this deepen our walk with you and our relationship with you. Let all that we do be born out of love for you, Father, not a dry sense of obligation or fear of hell. Thank you for the way that you motivate us powerfully through love. We want to be like Paul, as, as he said, the love for Christ, love of Christ compels me in everything that I do. Be with those that aren't able to join us, whether it's because of health issues or, or others meet their needs and all of the needs represented by those uh, here tonight and those who will join later by YouTube, friends, family members, people in the workplace, meet those needs in Jesus. And it's in his strong and mighty name that we pray, amen. All right, let me share my screen and get rid of the syllabus here. I want to, we're going to be looking at Psalm 67 through 80. And I want us uh, to uh, go on and listen to a bit more of the video, let's see, I won't take it all the way back to the beginning. Uh, I will go ahead and uh, move us along in the video. Here. The Book of Psalms, it's a collection of 150 ancient Hebrew books. It reads something like, may the Lord, the God of Israel be blessed forever and ever, amen and amen. So uh, and there he's just noting the structure of the five sections, the similar structure of the five books, Again, remember a new Torah that as they were in captivity, they compiled these, some of them written several hundred years earlier under David and others, but compiled into the book. These five books, a new Torah, helping them, a prayer book, helping them to learn to be faithful to God in a foreign land. So it's noting the similar ending on all of the five books. The book has a conclusion. It has an internal organization into five main parts. And so the natural place to go from here is now the beginning to look for an introduction. And what do we find? Psalms one and two. And I won't, uh, I'll go ahead and speak through a little bit of that. Psalm one, focusing on the Torah, the, the word of God. Uh, blessed is he who delights in his word. Psalm 2, the one about the Messiah, uh, the well-known Psalm 2, 7. Uh, you are my son. Today I have become your father. Ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance. Uh, and so God, 
the Father quotes that one at least a couple of times in the New Testament at Jesus' baptism on the Mount of Transfiguration. So I'm going to move on past that psalm. Defeat evil and rebellion among the nations. Now Psalm 2 I mean, concludes no. by saying that all those who take refuge in the Messianic King will be blessed. Precisely the word used to open Psalm 1. And so together, these two poems tell us that the book of Psalms is designed to be the prayer book of God's people as they strive to be faithful to the commands of the Torah as they hope and wait for the future messianic kingdom. Now with these two themes introduced, we can start to see how the smaller books have been designed as well around these two ideas. So for example, book one has right at the center a collection of poems. And I'm going to go ahead and repeat this because repetition is a good teacher. I've been through this probably 10 or 15 times over the years, but I still learn from it. Psalms 15 through 24 that opens and closes with a call to covenant faithfulness. And then Psalm 16 to 18, we find a depiction of David as a model of this kind of faithfulness. So he calls out to God to deliver him and God elevates him as king. Now in the corresponding set of poems, Psalms 20 to 23, the David of the past has become an image of the messianic king of the future, who will also call out to God, he will be delivered, and then given a kingdom over the nations. And then right at the center of this collection is a poem, Psalm 19, dedicated to praising God for the Torah. So here we go. The two themes from Psalms 1 and 2 are bound together tightly here. Book two opens with two poems that are united in their hope for a future return to the temple in Zion. And this is an image closely associated with the hope of the messianic kingdom. Then book two closes with a poem that depicts the future reign of the messianic king over all of the nation. This poem's really amazing because it echoes all these other passages from the prophets about the messianic kingdom. And it concludes by saying that this king's reign will bring about the fulfillment of God's ancient promise to Abraham him to bring God's blessing to all of the nations. Book three also concludes with a poem reflecting on God's promise to David, but this time in light of Israel's exile. So the poet remembers how God said he would never abandon the line of David, but now he's looking at Israel's rebellion and its result in destruction and exile and the downfall of the line of David. And so the poet ends by asking God to never forget his promise to David. Book four is designed to respond to this crisis all right, I'm going to pause there uh, because we're going to be working through books uh, two and then into uh, the first part. So continue to, I think this is so helpful, continue to keep this in mind. Psalms, the prayer book of God's people who are striving to be faithful to the Torah and waiting for the Messianic kingdom uh, while they are in exile in, in Babylon. So, and we, uh, we're part of the way uh, in book two. We'll be starting in 68 um, or 67. Hope for a future return to the temple. Uh, so for their, in their minds, literal temple back in Jerusalem. And of course that temple was built by Herod uh, beginning in about 40 BC, roughly 40 years before uh, Jesus's ministry. Uh, say Jesus began his ministry about 30. The temple had been under construction for about 40 years. So if I have the dates right, um, Herod, Herod the Great started it at about 10 years before Jesus was born. And But that is not the future temple or the indwelling place of the Holy Spirit uh, that Jesus begins to point people to. He said, when the disciples said, look, at how magnificent this temple is, Jesus said, I tell you, time's coming when not one stone will be left on the other. So this desire uh, 500 years earlier for a temple in Jerusalem, they thought they had it. They had it for some 60, so 70 years under construction part of that time. Uh, but then uh, it was destroyed by the Romans in 70 to 72 AD. Uh, and then it closes with the future reign of the Messianic King. Uh, so let's go again. We'll go 67 through 80. So open up your Bibles, Psalm 67. And as always, uh, I want you to participate. I want you to uh, 
speak up, uh, you know, at any point that you have questions, thoughts, input. So please don't don't hesitate. Uh, <clears throat> Psalm 67, I, I love it. It's good. It shows us the heart of God for all peoples, all nations. It's a it's you know, a missional psalm in that way. We were, of course, our 15 years in Africa working there uh, and then the years since then. So involvement, uh, well, roughly about 42 years of my life. I took out a semester of college in 1979, went to live with my aunt and uncle in Africa in Malawi. And then uh, four or five years later, went back to Kenya. So for about 42 years of my life, uh, God has sensitized me to the needs of all tribes, languages, peoples, and nations to know about Jesus. And I, so I love 67. Uh, just look at actually get any one of you to unmute, please, and read Psalm 67 for us. We get to hear a different voice and will help save my voice. I'm really Kurt. <clears throat> I think I'm reading Kurt. Yeah, go this ahead. Is... Okay. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face shine on us so that your ways may be known on earth, your salvation among all nations. May the peoples praise you, God. May all the peoples praise you. May the nations be glad and sing for joy, for you rule the peoples with equity and guide the nations of the earth. May the peoples praise you, God. May all the peoples praise you. The land yields this harvest, God. Our God blesses us. May God bless us still so that all the ends of the earth will fear him. Thank you, Diana. Uh, it's, it's easy for us to hear in there God's heart for the nation. So uh, we, we, we misread scripture if we see and especially the old testament if we think god was concerned only with israel uh yes he chose them for a purpose but all the way back to let me let me highlight this uh in another way here get to my browser go to uh Genesis 12, 1, uh, <clears throat> when God, God first calls Abraham in chapter 12 and repeats it in 15. But look at this to Abraham. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, curse whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So they talk about the top line and bottom line of the promise to Abraham, which really is to all of us. The top line is God says, I will bless you. Bottom line is all peoples will be blessed through you or we're, we are to go on and, and bless others. But so God, even though he called Abraham, who eventually became the father of the Israelites, uh, his concern, his purpose from the very beginning was that all peoples on earth would be blessed, including the, Can including the Canaanites and those that we can think of as being so wicked in the, in the Old Testament. So we cannot overemphasize uh, when we're looking at scripture, God's concern for all peoples. And so we have it here in this Psalm. And then when you get into the New Testament, uh, Jesus and a bunch of his parables, he, he echoes, or he really he doesn't echo, he strengthens that, uh, that call to uh, the kingdom will benefit all peoples. When he uses terms like the birds of the air will come and nest in this, this great shrub that grew from a tiny seed, that's a euphemistic way, of a cryptic way of referring to the Gentiles, the nations, the birds of the air. It's used that way throughout scripture. Uh, so it's saying 
the birds of the air, these nations of the world will come to this great uh, tree, this great kingdom uh, that will be established from tiny beginnings, from small beginnings, and so small that Jesus was crucified and put in a tomb, but as he resurrected, God grew it from there. So, give you the chance for any, I, I did fail before we moved beyond 67, look back at the end of 66, I think I, I at least mentioned it last week, but draw your attention to it if I did in verse 18, Psalm 66, 18, if I had cherished sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. Uh, and that's just a good reminder to us that holiness does matter. It's not saying that we have to be flawless because we can't be. Uh, we will stumble. And God's pleasure in us is not, does not hinge uh, on our performance. It's not like you probably did it growing up, take a a flower, a daisy or something, you know, and, and you pull off the petals. Us guys did it. So she loves me. She loves me not. She loves me. She loves me not. Uh, God isn't fickle like that with us. Uh, he's not, he's not good with us whenever we're doing pretty well and then down on us whenever we stumble. His love is steady. His gaze never changes. He, he has a piercing, loving gaze of which he looks at us, but that never changes. But if, if we cherish sin, we hold on to it, we don't, we don't seek to let the spirit work that out of us, uh, it, will effect, it will affect uh, the way the Lord is able to hear us and to respond to our prayers. So I appreciate that one. That's always a good reminder to me. Psalm 68, verse 5, Diana. Oh, Kurt, I just wanted to um, make note on verse number uh, 7. May God bless us still so that all the ends of the earth will fear him. That's like um, a prayer for the future, for everybody in the universe. You know, you fear God, then you love him. And it's like they're just trying to make a reference, not just for their time period, but for the future that's to come. Yeah, and, and that's, that's good. I appreciate you bringing that out, Diana. And we, we want to be that way, not like Hezekiah at the end of his reign. He, you know, he acted foolishly, showed off the Babylonians, all the treasures. Lord sent the prophet saying that was foolish of you to do that. They'll come and plunder you one day. And he said, well, it, but and he said it would be down the road, like with his grandchildren. And he said, well, at least it won't happen in my reign. Well, that's a pretty short-sighted, selfish way uh, to look at things. And as you know here, it's a generous prayer, Diana, a prayer for the future that God will bless. Uh, all peoples to the end of the earth. Uh, so Psalm 68, 5 and 6, you probably heard part of this. A father to the fatherless, a defender, a defender of widows is God in his holy dwelling. God sets the lonely in families. He leads forth the prisoners with singing. Now, okay, we 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 need to we'll we'll get this when we get into the Proverbs. And we, I think we've made a statement like this early on uh, in our study that scripture, Proverbs, poetry, uh, it states things like this. God sets the lonely in families. But we know of people who say it would long to be, to have a family and may not. You, so you can say, Yes, it's true, except when it's not. And that'll happen in the Proverbs. We'll see that. It doesn't mean that God's word isn't constant or true. Uh, it will, it, we need to, and we don't need to, you know, like quote this blithely to someone who is aching from loneliness. Uh, we need to be careful with that. The reality is some people, you know, 
are very lonely. They don't have a family they wish they had. Now, if they come into Christ, though, that's like a physical family. But for those who come into Christ, uh, our, our family immediately and exponentially can increase because we have a, a family in Christ. And, uh, and so in that sense, yes, it's always true. If someone honors God, loves God, belongs to God, though that person may be lacking a blood kin family, they are part of a, a spiritual family in Christ, uh, oftentimes where ties run deeper than the blood kin does. But it's good to pray that too for people to set the lonely in families. Look at verse 18, Psalm 60, 68, 18. Now this one's quoted, Paul quotes this in Ephesians 4, 8. 13, when you ascended on high, you led captives in your train, you received gifts from men, even from the rebellious, that you, O oh Lord God, might dwell there. Now, Paul, you know, when this was written, they were not thinking of the, you know, of this applying only to the Messiah. This was uh, leading captives in their train is what kings did when they came back from war. Paul says this was fulfilled in Christ. But just so that's the multiple fulfillments of scripture. It's like multiple tiers and an, a, a near fulfillment, but then there was a, a, a greater fulfillment down, down the road in history. Verse 19 Praise be to the Lord our God and sa our Savior, who daily bears our burdens. Our God is a God who saves, who daily bears our burdens. What about the Lord's Prayer? Father, give us today what we need today. Give us our daily bread, not our monthly bread, not our annual bread. Give us what we need for today, the grace that we need for today. And Susan and I have, for several years now, pray that pretty almost every day. There's some days that we miss praying it together. I try to, even if I breathe it as a prayer, oftentimes I pray it on my knees, but uh, I try to have this awareness daily. Father, just give us what we need for today, the grace, the strength, the patience. Uh, as Jesus said, I, I won't worry about tomorrow. So I think that's so helpful there. He daily bears our burdens. Uh, look at the closing verses of 68, 34, 35. Proclaim the power of God. 35, you are awesome, O God, in your sanctuary. The God of Israel gives power and strength. But that statement, proclaim the power of God. Speak of God's goodness. So you and let's don't, let's don't fail to take that away, to go to school on these psalmists, on these writers. He says, and this one in particular of David, uh, proclaim God's power in a, and his goodness. Speak of it. You and I need to do that. To easily speak of God's goodness. Go to 69, please, again. Uh, hands up or unmute if you want to share something. 69. Verse five, you know my folly, O oh God, my foolishness, my guilt is not hidden from you. But then to six, may those who hope in you not be disgraced because of me. Uh, that's one that I was looking for in our previous class. Uh, may those who hope in you not be disgraced because of me. Don't let my sin or my disobedience bring shame to others. Uh, verse nine is. Uh, it, it's all kind of messianic there. Verse seven, I endure scorn for your name. Eight, I'm a stranger to my brothers, an alien to my mother's own son, my own mother's sons. That happened some with Jesus when they didn't believe in him. Verse nine, for zeal for your house consumes me and the insults of those who insult you follow me. 
So we, that's quoted in John 2, 17. And then Paul again in Romans 15, zeal for your house consumes me. Uh, John 2, 17, when Jesus cleansed the temple. Um, go down to the uh, 20, 69, Psalm 69, verse 20, scorn has broken my heart. Uh, 21, they put gall in my food and gave me vinegar for my thirst. Uh, those, of course, on the cross. So there was a near fulfillment for David uh, feeling, you know, betrayed by his friends. Uh, so this is what it felt like to him. Gall, a very bitter herb. Um, but of course, literally happened uh, with Jesus. Uh, scorn has broken my heart back in 20. The scorn of the religious leaders, not just angering Jesus, but breaking his heart. 29, I'm in pain and distress. So uh, an application, a near application or fulfillment with David, but uh, an ultimate one further down the road with Jesus. But I think it still ministers to us. If you've been betrayed by or wounded by a loved one, a close friend, uh, then reflecting on what Jesus went through, reading about David's betrayal by those close to him, it can be helpful to, to put words to some of our emotions. Go on through 70 to 71. Uh, Verse 8, 71, verse 8. My mouth is filled with your praise, declaring your splendor all day long. All right, let's do that, folks. Let's, let's let God's praise fill our mouths to speak of his, his splendor, his goodness all day long. Nine, don't cast me away when I'm old. Don't forsake me when my strength is gone. But even... Even if there are some hard times in old age, look at verse 14, 71, 14. But as for me, I will always have hope. I will praise you more and more. My mouth will tell of your righteousness, of your salvation all day long. Though I know not its measure, though I don't, the psalmist here, that we don't have a, uh, one recorded as the author of this 71, but this psalm is saying, uh, even though I don't fully grasp uh, the height, width, depth, like Paul refers to there in Ephesians 3, like of God's love, I will always speak of you. My mouth will tell of your righteousness. So, yes, Diana. I, I like this one, Kurt. It's like a prayer um, uh, from an older person. And verse number five, it says, for you have been my hope, sovereign Lord, my confidence since my youth. You know, he goes all the way back to when he was uh, in his mother's womb, you know, praising God and thanking him for, you know, where he is and, and what's going on in his life. And verse 17, since my youth, God, you have taught me. And to this day, I declare your marvelous deeds. And, you know, when we go through things in life and, and we really um, tune in to, to our spirit, you know, and, and you talk to God and, and you want to just praise him, just thank him for everything. You will have a tendency to go back, you know, to when you were small and when you were maybe, maybe not to the mother's womb, but I thought that was amazing how, you know, he's just had so much compassion, you know, to try to just, just, just tell God what it's, what it's all about for him. Yeah. You know, this is, yeah it's wonderful. Oh, thank you, Diana. I love, you know, having y'all share and give insights. Yeah, so because I hadn't observed that about being kind of a reflection of someone, of someone older back to their youth. And uh, it is similar. Let me pull up uh, the scripture here. Uh, Jeremiah 6, 16, 
not just when we're old, but even when we're young. This is what the Lord says. Stand at the crossroads and look. Ask for the ancient paths. Ask for the good way is and walk in it. And you will find rest for your souls. Now, bad thing about the sad thing about Israel is they basically said, no, we're not going to do it. We're going we're gonna to find our own way. We're going to do it our way, like the old song from the 70s. Was it Helen Reddy? I'll do it. Well, no, that was, uh, no, not hers. Uh, that was probably more like uh, one of the crooners. Uh, I'll do it my way. Uh, but he's telling us if we will, like this psalmist is doing, and like you said, uh, uh, Diana, uh, look back and, and, and in the company of good people, of saintly people, uh, reflect on God's good ways and what he has for us. Uh, you know, uh, there are ancient truths that are still relevant. We need, to, we need to help modernize them. We need to make them applicable to people that don't maybe have a church background. So we need to be careful about just uh, maybe some of our religious language, but find ways to help people to see uh, today that while uh, God gives us some really good guidance for our lives, uh, look on down there in 71, verse 18. Even when I'm old and gray, do not forsake me, O God, till I declare your power to the next generation. So again, back to the thought you kind of shared earlier, Diana, at the end of the previous psalm about, uh, or at the end of 67, telling others that others may know. Uh, so for those of us that are grandparents, um, Three of ours just landed back in the U.S. from Africa on uh, Saturday. They were uh, over in the Memorial Church of Christ area uh, and then left to go to Fort Worth today. Uh, our grandkids, along with our son and daughter-in-law, but with our grandkids, let's don't uh, fail to declare God's goodness to them, to the next generation, our kids, our grandkids or even our great grandkids, mother and dad, part of the reason that we moved back up uh, West Texas in the panhandle to be closer to mother and dad, dad's 90, mother's 87. Uh, mother and dad have five, five of us kids, 13 grandchildren. And I think the number right now, great grandchildren's at 34. Uh, and when we, anytime we go and we see mother and dad more often now, again, that's one of our big reasons for being here. Uh, but anytime we spend the night there, we always have a, a reading and prayer in the evening. And dad, uh, when he prays, he'll go through the entire family and uh, by name, uh, not just five kids, and the 13 grandkids, but the 34 great grandkids and pray for them all. And, and their witness, you know, they've spoken of God's goodness uh, to uh, us, the second generation, the third generation, and a good example for all of us to follow. Uh, 24, just, just look, look, look. Uh, one teacher, when I got back from Africa and was at Lubbock Christian University, I was both on the Bible faculty uh, but also working on my master's, finishing my master's degree. And one good teacher, Jesse Long, uh, said, look at the verbs, notice the verbs in, in, in the text and look at 71, uh, 22 and following. I will praise you with the heart. I will sing your praise with the lyre. My lips will shout for joy when I sing praise to you. My tongue will tell of your righteous acts all day long. There's, there's a lot of action in there. Let's don't miss that. Uh, speak of God's goodness. Let his praise fill our mouths. Uh, when, we're read, when we're tempted to throw a pity party of one even, uh, I, I have a daily reminder pop up. 
Kirk, you have more blessings than problems. Uh, 95 year old Grandma Johnson said that it was quoted uh, in Choose Gratitude by Nancy Lee DeMoss, uh, quoting 95 year old Grandma Johnson. I have more blessings than problems. A couple of times I've been quoting that and I turned it around accidentally. I have more problems than blessings. Well, yeah, that's what that's what we can feel like. Ah, oh, I've got more problems than blessings, but it's not true. We we do have more blessings than problems. 72 is the end of book two, and so rain, messianic rain and there's several things in 72 to move on through it uh, so it's it is a of solomon so it can be about solomon or by solomon we don't know for sure uh so yes they had images of all of this being fulfilled the near application was in david and then in solomon Look at verse 11. So you can see the way that it was. All kings will bow down to him. All nations will serve him. But that was only a partial fulfillment in David and Solomon. The ultimate fulfillment was in, is in Jesus. Not that they bow down to him in a military sense, conquered by the sword. But throughout the ages, uh, rulers have bowed the knee to Jesus some willingly, some uh, unwillingly. Uh, verse 12, 72, 12, he will deliver the needy who cry out, afflicted who have no one to help. What about the Samaritan woman in John 4 or the adulterous woman in John 8? No one there to help her. Jesus saves them, saves the needy from death. Well, yes, uh, the adulterous woman in John 8. For precious in, at verse 14, precious in, is their blood in his sight. What about Stephen in Acts 7, verse 55, where he was stoned to death? His blood was precious. The early church developed the saying that the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. As the blood was spilled on the ground, churches would sprout up. Verse 17. May his name endure forever. It does in Jesus. The end of verse 17, all nations will be blessed through him. They will call him blessed. Ah, well, didn't we see something about that in Genesis 12, 3? And all nations will be blessed through him. Here it is. Verse 19, praise be to his glorious name forever. May the whole earth be filled with his glory. That's Habakkuk 2.14. Uh, all the earth will be filled with the, uh, the glory of the knowledge of him. And, and let's don't think that's not happening today. We, we err. We, we just get it wrong. If we, if we just mainly listen to headline news and, and how bad things are, or even some Christian sources that just always have a doomsday voice. God is at work in the world. We need to read some of the books and sources like Tom Doyle uh, that talks about what's happening, what God is doing in the Middle East, even through the death of some of the uh, formerly Muslim believers who come to Christ, the way that uh, God uh, is making, the, the way that Christ is being made known. China is cracking down hard again on believers, but even there, the church is, is growing stronger. The earth is being filled with the knowledge of Jesus. Uh, and some of the changes, we don't need to bemoan all of the changes even occurring in our own country. We just need to pray that God will help us leverage them for Jesus' sake. We do. It does us no good to kind of stand back and curse the darkness or talk about, you know, oh, we're going to hell in a handbasket. I don't know exactly where that saying came from, but uh, 
you know, to always have kind of a negative view like that. No, no, no. God is at work. We don't want a, a bunker mentality, a foxhole mentality where we're just trying to hang in there. The old cat poster, you know, where he's hanging on uh, and it just says hanging in there. No, that's not what Jesus said, Matthew 16, 18. On this knowledge that I am the Christ, I will build my church. And it says the gates of hell will not prevail against it. It means Jesus' church will plunder hell. Jesus' church will break down the gates of hell and set the prisoners free. So we don't need to view the church as being beat up and battered. And we need to be we need to be active in our faith and bold in our faith that and pray that that God will continue to plunder hell and set the prisoners free. That's a little bit of preaching there, but I think it's important when we think about what God is doing through Christ. When we get into book three, Psalm 73. And this is very similar to Jeremiah 12. And it's it says a psalm of Asaph. So <clears throat> I related to this a lot 20 years ago. I memorized a lot of it because that's really kind of where I was. I, I was a little more upset at God. God, it seems like basically kind of what he's saying here. It seems to me like you make it easy on the wicked and hard on the righteous because he <clears throat> he says things like verse two as for me my feet had almost slipped i nearly lost my foothold maybe a way of saying i almost lost my faith i envied the arrogant when i saw the prosperity of the wicked they have no struggles their bodies are healthy and strong they're free from the burdens common to man now all of this is not strictly true of course but you know, in his perspective, it's like they're not plagued by human ills. Verse six, pride is their necklace. Seven, from their hard hearts comes evil. Eight, they scoff, speak with malice. Nine, they're boastful, they claim to heaven. Ten, and, they, and it's, he says, it seems like people just fall all over themselves to follow them. Their people turn to them. They drink up waters in abundance. 12, this is what the wicked are like. Carefree, they increase in wealth. He says, 13, my life's been harder. 13, surely in vain, I've kept my heart pure. In vain, I've washed my hands in innocence. All 14, all day long, I've been plagued. I've been punished every morning. So you can see the contrast that he draws. The wicked seem to have it easy in God. It's been hard for me. Then look at 15. There's kind of a turning point. If I had said, I'm going to say that I'm going to tell this to everybody. He says, then I would have betrayed your children. When I tried to under, understand all of this, like the wicked prospering, it was oppressive to me. Look at 17. There's a real, a real turning point there until I entered the sanctuary of God. Then I understood their final destiny. So he says, 18, I do understand that the wicked don't always prosper. They suffer. They're swept away. Uh, notice that when he did not worship, he was tempted to rant and rave at God. God, you're unfair. Job did that, like in Job 24. We noticed that back when we went through Job. Jeremiah does it in Jeremiah 12. And Asaph is doing it here. But he says, when I came to worship, he says, when I tried to figure it out with my own brain, it was too much for me. But when I worship, then I began to see more clearly. 
look at 21. When I, when my heart was grieved, when my, when my heart was bitter, I was like a brute beast. He says, I was, I was animal-like my, with my bitter heart. Now, don't miss that. It's like Hebrews 12, 15. See to it that no one misses the grace of God and that no root of bitterness spring up to defile many. If, you, if you're struggling with bitterness in your heart, if any, any of us, but I'll just go ahead and say it to you because I say it to myself too. If, you, if you're struggling, if you're if you've allowed some bitterness in your heart and don't say I'll just say it strongly don't excuse yourself saying yeah but you don't know how they hurt me. you don't know what they did to me there is nothing that we have been through that Jesus did not go through and as badly as he was betrayed what is his prayer on the cross father smash their feet no, Father, forgive him. So, you know, I just share with you from God's word. Uh, yeah, please guard against any bitterness in your heart because uh, it will it will poison you. Yeah, Kimba. Hi, Brother Kirk. Um, I'm going to go back to what you were saying about how in the first part, um, he's talking about the wicked and how they prosper and how the lives of the righteous are so hard. And two thoughts came to my mind. One where, um, where I was reading, well, kind of reading in Luke, where um, God was, where Jesus was talking with his disciples and saying how hard it will be for the rich to enter into heaven. And his disciples said to him, well, if, it's, if that's true, then who can go to heaven? And I, uh, then I was thinking back to when we were studying Job and how in the ancient world, the idea was that if you were rich, you were righteous and God blessed you. Yeah. And if you were um, poor and dealing with a lot of things, you had some kind of sin in your life and God was punishing you. Yeah. Um, and how that even persisted into the New Testament. So it's good to see that in the Psalms here, they're still talking about that, um, the problem of human suffering and why yeah. is it that people who seem so wicked have such a, um, you know, or a seemingly easy life, which I don't think their lives are as easy as we think they are. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, but I, that just hit me that, you know, that was something, I mean, uh, something we still struggle with, but even his, even Jesus' disciples struggle with that concept. And I was also thinking about, too, the story, and I don't know where it is, the story of the man who was born blind, and his disciples asked him, who sinned? Was it him or his parents? Yeah. He was like, he didn't sin. Nobody did. It was so that, you know, God's glory could be manifested, basically. Yeah, and that's John 9. That's good. Uh, good to bring that up, Ken, but John 9. And thank you for all those reflections. Uh, because it, it is, I think it's it's good to set scripture alongside each other like that, looking at Job and going forward to the <clears throat> to the New Testament. And you're right, in our better moments, we know that the those who don't fear God, their lives are not better. But in our bitter moments, uh, it can sure seem that way to us. And uh, I just, yeah, let's not, let's not let that uh, be lost on us, what he was saying. When I was embittered, I was like an animal. And uh, that is so true. Yet, verse 23, but I'm always with you. You hold me by my right hand. You guide me with your counsel. And afterward, you'll take me into glory. Who do I have in heaven but you and on earth? Earth has nothing I desire beside you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Uh, 28, as for me, it's good to be near God. I have made the sovereign Lord my refuge. I will tell of all your deeds. 
And often in my prayer, just to remind myself, I will continue to say that, Father, we will speak of your goodness. I will speak of your goodness all of my life. Uh, I'm talking myself into it. I'm, I'm forgetful. I'm leaky. And I need to be reminded. I need to be filled up. And it takes language. It takes verbiage on our part, you know, to help us to live that way. Uh, all right. Well, going on in our remaining 15 minutes and some others that we'll work through. 74 is one of these that was written. We know there's some Psalms that were written while they were in captivity. So David was king, David and Solomon around uh, 900s. And they were in captivity in five, you know, from 586 onwards you know, down to 540. So roughly a 400 year period, say between David and some of these in captivity. Uh, but this one uh, is one that was written uh, in captivity because he says, why have you rejected us, O oh God? Uh, you rejected us forever. Uh, and that's why they so long for Zion because they're, they're in captivity. Uh, Verse four, your foes roared in the place where you met with us in the temple. They behaved like men wielding axes. Uh, so they destroyed a lot of the temple. But God wasn't attached to the temple. The temple wasn't his. The, the people had idolized it by that point. Uh, Verse nine, look at their discouragement. We're given no miraculous signs, no prophets are left, and none of us knows how long this will be. Oh, that sounds familiar. We hear ourselves saying or others, how long, oh God, until Jesus returns. Uh, but that, so the Psalm is all about God seeming to be silent and absent. We don't need to miss to misinterpret God's silence as absence. In the roughly four to five hundred years between the close of the four hundred years, four fifty, between the end of Malachi and the beginning of Matthew, between the end of the Old Testament and the beginning of the New Testament, though God may have been silent, he was not absent. He was at work through the nations preparing for the birth of his son. He worked through the Greeks. Alexander the Great, uh, to spread a common language around the known world. He worked through the Romans, then to make roads around the known world, so that by the time Jesus came, and Jesus largely operated just in Judea and Galilee, but then Paul and the other apostles used the language that the Greeks had given, they used the roads that the Romans had built and traveled throughout the known world proclaiming Jesus. Diana. Yeah, Kirk, I have a question on um, verse number 11. Why do you hold back your hand, your right hand? Why is it that he stated your right hand? What's so significant about that? In the good question, in the Old Testament, the right hand, uh, you know, like uh, Stephen, before they killed him, he said he, he saw Jesus at God's right hand. Uh, right hand was the greatest place of honor, but it's also was their, you know, generally their stronger arm. They... For the most part, you know, they were right-handed. They wielded swords with the right arm, the right hand. Uh, and so that's that was, except for some of the Benjaminites, you know, that were left-handed. Uh, predominantly, they were right-handed. He said, so why hold back your right hand? Uh, he's wanting, he's calling on God to strike their enemies. Well, Jesus has a different message. Not strike them, but forgive them. Uh, but that's that's why the significance of the right hand, Diana, throughout 
it's just, it's just more powerful. From there, it's you know anthropomorphism. It's attributing to God our 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 traits and attributes. Uh, but for them as humans, their right hand was their more powerful one. Okay, that sounds good. Uh, they ask him to remember his covenant, verse 20 in Psalm 74, have regard for your covenant. 75, uh, a Psalm of Asaph, we give thanks to you, O God, we give thanks for your name is near. Men tell of your wonderful deeds. Um, so just that language of always uh, giving praise and honor to God. Look at 76. Uh, here, a Psalm of Asaph. <clears throat> Look at verse, I'm sorry. <clears throat> Clear my throat. Verse four. You are resplendent with light, more majestic than mountains rich with gain. <clears throat> Well, that's interesting, right? Resplendent with light. And we, we read that also back in 36.9. And so you go to like Matthew 17 and the transfiguration. And of course he doesn't, Matthew doesn't use the language uh, that the others do. 17.5, while he was still speaking, a bright cloud enveloped him, a voice from the cloud. This is my son whom I love. So this is my son, that's Psalm 2.7, whom I love. Uh, Genesis 22, listen to him. Uh, Isaiah 40, uh, 42. Uh, so is it Mark, in his account of the transfiguration, it says his, it was a, such a radiant white, his garments were whiter than any, any launderer on earth could render them. So you are resplendent with light, but, but, but let's don't restrict it only to the transfiguration. Uh, it, that light, or let me pose it as a question, how, do we, how are we to radiate with the light of Christ? How, how does it, it's not a trick question, just, you know, response from the thing. How, how are we to radiate? How is it possible for us to radiate the light of Christ? He said, you're the light of the world. So how does it work? How, how, how are we to be light? Well, Kurt, I think it's when we devote our time to prayer and praise to God, and it just has a, it puts you in a different type of feeling uh, in your body and your spirit. When you talk okay. to people, they can tell, you know, that you are, you know, a child of God, that, that you are what they would classify you as a, as a Christian. So I think yeah. it's, you know, in the, in our prayer and, and our praise life. Yeah. Yeah. That helps, you know, that kind of devotion to God. And let's, let's, uh, let's define uh, a, a teacher did that the other day and it caught my attention. I'd read it years before, but I'd kind of failed to notice that devotion helps. It, it means our our love for our emotion for God deepens not just our knowledge not a dry head knowledge but our devotion to God our love for him it's again my grandmother Hayes that she loved God so much she didn't talk about him because she was afraid of hell she talked about him because she loved him and 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 whenever we have God's spirit in us like that there will be a radiance about us. So what is true about Jesus, he's resplendent with light. Uh, you know, I, I believe I did show you this, but uh, from that Psalm 34, five and six, those who look to him are radiant. Their faces are never covered with shame. Remember the light on their faces. Uh, 
they are resplendent with light that has to come somewhere you know there, there's no there's no cosmetics that gave them that glow that comes from comes from the Holy Spirit and Diana as you're saying when we nurture the you know not You're chopping up, Kurt. <clears throat> Did we lose him? I believe so. Yeah. Maybe he'll come back in. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe he's, maybe he's finished. <laughs> he normally takes us for about another six minutes. Oh, we're still recording, ladies. Uh huh. So he'll be back for sure. Okay. Uh -huh. Um, do we think he's going to make it back? I don't know. Maybe he can't get back in. Okay, good night, Pat. Okay, this was a good night, ladies. <coughs> oh, <everyone>. so. <laughs> He'll catch us up next week. Yes. Okay. Have a good week, everyone. Right. Good night. Thanks. Same to you. Bye, yes. everybody. Bye-bye.